and welcome to Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Hawaii is a paradise. It has beautiful people, scenery, and a just a wonderful, wonderful environment in which to live and to grow. And yet, did you know that there's also a dark side of paradise? At least many parts of Hawaii have been in the dark for many, many years. And one of them was this little town of Wahiwa. I remember growing up and being in Wahiwa from time to time, being told by my mother, don't go down that street because there are bad people there. Well, it wasn't so much that there were bad people there, but there were bad things that happened to people there in those places. She wanted me to stay away as a little boy. But as the years went on, I was saddened to see Wahiwa facing many conditions, such as homelessness, a lack of employment for people who work there, and a high level of crime. But lo and behold, over the years, something amazing has been happening in that town, especially over the last decade. I'd even use the word transformation. There's a little group that's been responsible for transforming Wahiwa into a place of vibrancy in terms of opportunities to work, dealing with crime, dealing with all kinds of behaviors that used to bring Wahiwa down. And that group is called Surfing the Nation. I'm pleased today to have my long-term friend, Tom Bauer, the president of Surfing the Nation to talk with us just a little bit about what took place and how it happened. You're going to enjoy meeting him. Tom, welcome to the program. Hey, Kelly. Good to, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. So this glad, exciting. Tom. You know, yeah. Surfing the Nations has done so much good for Wahiwa and the world. I'm sure our viewers are going to enjoy hearing your stories. But first, tell me a little about you. You're a surfer. Yeah, I was one of those surfers uh, from California and just surfed all over the world, you know, and that's what I've been what doing What brought my you to life. Hawaii? Uh, all kinds of different things, but surfing was one of them. But just helping people was the greatest thing of just giving back to the community. And uh, I had actually, I was all, one of those long haired hippies living in Kauai in 1968, you know. And then my life radically changed, and I didn't want to be a taker, but I wanted to be a giver. So it's well, good that's to be back great in to hear. And you have a wonderful wife, Cindy, and yeah. four beautiful daughters. Well, you know, tell me a little bit about how you found Wahiwa originally, back at least a decade ago. Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, actually a friend heard from a friend that uh, there were, they were selling a, a bar there and some apartments, and so that was the beginning. And, of course, when I first had, you know, when I used to go surf on the North Shore, I went into Wahi and I said, like, this is the last place I would ever want to live. What were the conditions up the there? The conditions were really bad. You know, there was the bar, there was the 24-hour porn shop, there was the liquor store, the strip club with the brothel in the back that a lot of people don't even know about. And a huge amount of this was clustered together right at the Altogether. main entrance to right. Wahiwa. Right. It's kind of that. That was the, that was Ojai Street. What took place at, at night over there? Well, there was a lot, you know, a lot of prostitution, drugs, you know, and I think anybody who's a long-term Hawaii, Hawaiian and lives in Hawaii, they know that to live and be in Ojai Street is really dangerous, you know, drugs, prostitution, sex, murders, and a lot of people called it Blood Alley because it was just that notorious. That? It also serviced the uh, military base that was right, right across right. the highway from it, right. Schofield Barracks. Yeah, I remember being told by my mother when we lived in Wahiwa, just never go into that little area at the beginning of it because there were things taking place there she wanted to shield me from. What was it, what was it like for young people who lived in the area, teenagers? Uh, it was pretty, pretty crazy, you know, so like even when we moved in there, because I have four daughters, if somebody asked my daughters where they live and they said they live in uh, Wahiwa, and then they told them Ojai Street, they would really get upset about that. Because they just thought it was but, but it's really amazing how the transformation has come and you just go in there and you just start loving and you just start, you know, finding the needs in the community and solving problems. Well, you mentioned earlier that you went up there and you saw that there was a bar for sale, and that right. kind of started the work that you do up there. Tell me a bit about what happened. You, you bought the bar? Yeah, so we bought the bar, the Top Hat Bar, a very famous bar, uh, with the apartments in the back, and next to it was a 24-hour porn shop. And it was interesting. We just kind of like just laid our hands on that uh, porn shop and just loved them and, you know, didn't do anything inappropriate. There was no wall between us and them. And then... We had this youth group come, and they just kind of, you know, were singing and put their hands in paint on the wall. And like okay. three months after they left, the owner called my wife and said, hey, I really feel that I'm to get out of the business, and I want Surf the Nations to buy the porn shop. Are you interested? Of course, my wife said, well, we don't, we don't want the porn business, but we want the building. <laughs> and that's how we purchased that. And then next to that was a, a liquor store with a house in the back, and then next to that 
was another, was the, it was called the, uh, what was it called? It was called the Texas Bar. And, and in the back, it had a brothel and it had apartments. And My independently goodness. of each other, we went to them and they all wanted to sell all at the same time. So we were able to buy, you know, half a city block in Wahiwa. My goodness. Now that's phenomenal. So what did you start doing with these buildings once you bought them? Well, we just, we brought in volunteers and we just started just fixing them up every single day, I think. Even now, every day, we, we get a little further and just, you know, restoring, building them, painting them, and, uh, you know, bringing transformation to Wahiwa. So what are you operating up there right now? Well, we operate, uh, you know, we have a training, it's what we call it, an, uh, um, what do we call it? We call it uh, an internship where what we do is we invite people from all over the world to come and to see what we're doing. So we basically teach them to give back to their community. So everything that we do in Wahiwa is transferable. So we do. Underprivileged kids, we're the largest private distributor of food in conjunction with the Hawaii Food Bank. And of course, I've served on the neighborhood boards. My wife, she's on the, you know, the Leila Lahua High School board of directors there, works with the food bank. So we're constantly giving back to bring well, that's incredible. So you're the largest distributor with Hawaii Food Bank. Yeah, in of connection food. with them. That's incredible. Now, yeah. who is it that you actually feed up there? I mean, who, well, who are the people? Well, we feed in Kali, if you've ever seen, like, on uh, uh -huh. Vineyard. Oh, so you're based the... in Wahiwa, and you go all the way across the island yeah. to Kalihi yeah. to distribute food. Yeah, so we've been food. doing this for almost, uh, well, maybe 20-some years. Yeah, and so we have just volunteers who come, and then we do it. We have a pantry in Wahiwa, and then we do a distribution, like, every other Wednesday. Uh, right there in the back, on actually on Ojai Street. You know, recently I went through Wahiwa, and uh, I was just stunned at how clean and how industrious and how uh, just lively the, the little area that you've moved into looks compared to the way it used to be many, many years ago. Tell me a little bit about the people. I'm sure you've seen lives transformed oh, both in your organization with volunteers and also neighbors. Yeah, there's this, well, there's so many, but, you know, the thing is that there's so many different organizations that are helping to bring transformation. So you're kind of a nexus. You bring well, people we're just, together. Well, we're just, we're just part of something that's bigger. So now all of a sudden you've got investors, you've got, like, you've got the Blue Zone, you've got DOTS, you've got all these different organizations in Wahiwa that are now really making a concentrated effort to really make change in that. So it's, a, it's really a team effort. You know, so the, all the people in the Heights... So sometimes it gets a little confusing because there's Lower Wahiwa and there's the Heights. And so when you talk about Wahiwa, you don't want to say Wahiwa in general is just, you know, the Ojai Street area. It's really all the great things that are happening up in the Heights and all the great people that live there that are now giving back to that part of the community. Well, so that's, that's a community effort. You know, that's great to hear. Now, your organization is a nonprofit organization. Yeah, humanitarian. And it's based upon character building. Yeah. While many of you who operate it have a deep faith, it's not a religious organization per se. It's, it's a character-building organization that brings volunteers together. How many volunteers do you generally have? Oh, well, we just had, like, this semester we had, like, you know, from up to 75. So, and where uh, do they come from? They come from all over the world. So they hear about what we're doing, and then what we do is we teach them character, and then they go back, and everything we do they can do back in their hometown. So that's to serve the, the homeless or the or the needy, or find out basically what the need is in their town and then try to solve it. That's incredible. And yeah. so in a sense, you model a type of community building that they can take across the world. And that's, what, that's what's so exciting about it. That it's all transferable. You can duplicate it. So there's all these communities all around the world. So like right now, we're just, uh, my wife and a team is in Egypt. And actually what we're doing is we're having a surf camp right there on the Mediterranean Agami. And with, uh, we started a little surf thing there, and so we're, they're doing a surf camp there right now as we're talking. Well, you know, I want to come back during the second half of our program today and talk a little okay. bit more about your adventures across the world, because you, you've grown from simply dealing with people in Hawaii, now traveling through your Surfing the Nations program to how many countries? Well, I've been to 100. 100 countries. Yeah. In fact, uh, after the break, don't go away, because we'll talk also about adventures that Surfing the Nation has had in North Korea. But for a little bit more, a couple more minutes, let's talk about Wahiwa. You know, one of the things that you believe in, is important is for people to get beyond the stage where they need a handout. Although we have to have a safety net for people when they're, they reach the bottom, what you try to do is bring people into a productive lifestyle that has 
a level of entrepreneurship. You want mm -hmm. to tell me a bit about that? Right. So one of our one of our key things are our components is really to teach business. So that's why we've started businesses there. So we have a coffee shop. It's called Surfers Coffee. So we actually we invite the homeless to come in. They can come in there. They don't even have to buy anything. And what we're doing is we're just loving on them to show them that we believe in them. And then we have people from all over the world, and we're teaching them how to do business. We have like an antique shop, and then we have other shops that we're leasing out. So there's an ice cream shop, there's a surf shop, there's, a, there's also a sandwich shop. And so these are all helping us. So we've got people from all over the world that come and bring, say, like their school, to actually see what we're doing, that you can go into business and actually make an impact in your community. I so, understand even recent, recently one of your volunteers was a graduate of Harvard Business. Right. And, and she had some observations to make about what you were doing. Well, I asked her, I said, like, tell me what you learned at Harvard. And she said, number one, every nonprofit should be self-sustaining. So that really, really just went to my heart. So our goal is, is to go into business for the purpose of get gaining so we can give back. And that's what's happening. That these young people can see that, hey, it's not about taking, it's about giving back. Now, I remember way in the beginning, you and I used to get together and talk. And yeah. Surfing the Nations was a dream, and it had a budget of zero dollars. Yeah, zero dollars. <laughs> started with nothing. And, and, and now today, what, what's an annual budget look like for Surfing the oh, Nations? Oh, don't even ask me that. That's a, that's a big question, but it's a lot. It's I, a I lot. It's, you know, so the thing is, is that we're learning to invest, and mm -hmm. that's, I think that that's part of our success. It's not only investing in people, but it's investing in real estate, and it's, it's investing to give back. So I believe that my purpose is not only to invest in myself, but it's for the purpose of investing in others. And that's what we're doing in, in Hawaii Farm. We're well, giving back. That's an important philosophy to teach business entrepreneurship. It, yeah. It's important for people not only to have programs that are sustainable, but in their own lives, to develop personal financial sustainability. So is that one of the things you teach, personal Absolutely. finance? Yeah, it's so all. What do you we, teach your people? Well, so what we do is we have, you know, we, we have a, a school um, that, that basically teaches you how to go into business, how to start it, what what it takes, you know, so you do a business plan, and then what it does is it helps them to have a mindset, because you've really got to change the mindset of this generation to believe that they can be successful. So there's more of a negative than a positive, and what we do is that we believe that everybody needs encouragement, but very few know how to give it. When it comes to business, that's part of our goal, is to encourage them to go into business for the purpose of then investing in others. Have some of the people launched businesses that are sustaining themselves Well, we have now? some. We have, uh, yeah, actually right now we've been going to Bangladesh, and maybe we can talk about that, but we're trying to help some of the Bengali boys that didn't know English, and maybe we'll tell the story, but we're helping them to go into business. Well, that's great to hear. Now, when people come to Wahiwa, where should they go if they want to learn more about the little town that you're starting up? Well, they can go to the Surfer's Coffee right there on Cam Highway, but our offices are in the back. We have a two-story office building, a brand new one. We actually mm -hmm. tore down the brothel and built the two-story um, office building there. That we, that we have like a conference room. We're putting in a dance studio. We have an art, art studio there as well. And um, it's a way for us to give back to, you know, to meet all the needs of the community there. Did you have any opposition as you started your endeavor? <clears throat> well, the opposition was just a misunderstanding of, you know, who we are and what we're going to do. And the thing is that the, the Wahiwa, the lower Wahiwa, has such a bad reputation that it affects the people who live in the heights. And so what we've tried to do is try to not bring that negative side to Wahiwa uh, because we just believe that Wahiwa is, is the most amazing town. But we're, we're all working together as a team to well, that's great to hear. Well, when we come back from the break, as I promised our viewers, I'm going to ask you a bit about the worldwide ambassadorship of Surfing the Nations. And you've gone to over 100 countries. Your wife is there, is right now in Bangladesh with a team. Uh, she's in Egypt. Oh, she's in Egypt. She's in Egypt with a team. And uh, looking forward to hearing more about that. My guest today is Tom Bauer, president of Surfing the Nations, learning about transforming a little town of Wahiwa here on Oahu and also transforming the world. We'll be right back after this. I'm Kili'i Akina on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Don't go away. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off, and so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories.
Hey, hello everyone and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us and uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Kili'i Akina with my guest, Tom Bauer, President of Serving the Nations. I don't know if you got to see the March 2019 edition of Honolulu Magazine, but it features the work of Serving the Nations in Wahiwa Town. And here's a photo of Tom and his lovely wife, Cindy. And Tom, is this in the little cafe that you have up there? Yeah, that's actually, it's, it's right next to it. There's a little alleyway that we're developed and it's really kind of unique and kind of cute. Well, that's great, great to it's hear. It's a good little place and parking in the back. So. Well, I hope our viewers are able to come up and sample some I of the, so. your food up there. Now, tell me a little bit about the worldwide outreach of Serving the Nations. You've been to over 100 countries, but it had to start somehow. What, what, what was the genesis of the first country you took surfing to as a form of ambassadorship and goodwill? Well, it started off in Europe, and then I ended up, you know, going surfing in Angola and Morocco, and I went down to Southwest Africa. Actually, I got on a, on a boat with my van uh, from Portugal to Angola, and then I drove down, and I ended up, you know, going to South Africa, Mozambique, and actually, I ended up immigrating to Zimbabwe. So what exactly happens when you go as an ambassador of surfing? What is, what is the specialness of surfing to people across the world? Well, we, I, here's my opinion. I think that surfing is the greatest sport in the history of mankind. And with that comes responsibility for the surfer to give back. What makes it so great? It's just amazing. I, I, I wrote down every single sport in the world. And when I put it on my scale, surfing turned out to be the best one. There's a natural response of people, even those who don't surf, to surfing as a culture. What have you seen across the world? Well, everywhere, because there's 185 nations that have coasts. And so when you go to those nations and you bring a surfboard to a kid who's lived on the beach his whole life, and you show him what it is, and you see him stand up, he'll lift his hands up, and so much excitement, and then the rest is history. So what exactly do you try to communicate through this process of surfing? What is your message that you take to the world? Well, the message is, is a message of hope. It gives value. It gives them a purpose, a destiny. It, it creates jobs. Uh, like an example, like in Bangladesh, I just got on a plane. I looked at a, a world map and said, there's surf there. I got on a plane, didn't know anybody, and just showed up. And now there's a whole big surf club and movies being made. And the, the, the young kids now are becoming adults. They're, they all speak English. So some of the doctors that have PhDs would come down from Dhaka down to Cox Bazar in Bangladesh, and they would be so surprised that these street kids would speak English. They, they couldn't even believe it was possible. But because they wanted to communicate with us, it changed their mindset, and they learned English. Now, you regularly take teams of volunteers across the world as mm -hmm. surfers. To right. Carry this good will message of character, hope, yeah. and bringing it to people who otherwise may not have such hope. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about one of these trips. Well, like Bangladesh, when we went there, mm -hmm. um, you figure we just, just went out on the water and there was this guy. He had purchased a surfboard, didn't speak any English, and when he saw us, he came running out on the water and he became one of our best friends. And now, after all these years, like 15 years, they call me the architect of surfing in Bangladesh. And even the, the government and the uh, tourist association has thanked us for bringing something to Bangladesh, because Bangladesh is not kind of a tourist destination. But now surfing is on the map, and it's making an impact in the communities of uh, Bangladesh. How big was the group you took over? Uh, there must have been like maybe eight of us or so. Eight of you went? Yeah. And what did you do when you were there? Well, we just loved on the people, and we just, we just went out surfing and just started, you know, getting kids and pushing them on the surfboards. And before you know it, there, and we left some surfboards there, and we went back, and brought, you know, surfboards and boogie boards and introduced them into the sport. And now it's a thriving uh, surfing community there in Bangladesh. What other countries have you gone to? Well, right now the team is in uh, Egypt, if you can believe that. A lot of people say, like, they're surfing in Egypt. And, yeah, they surf all along the Mediterranean. In fact, there's, like, I think there's 20,000 surfers in Israel alone. So we were able to, like, help introduce surfing into the culture. 
Uh, we had the first surf contest years ago in Egypt, and now we're doing a surf camp for the, the local Bedouin kids and the local kids wow. there in Agami, yeah. So it's exciting just to see how surfing just really just does something to an individual. What happens at a surf camp? How many kids are involved? Uh, it depends. It could be like I probably right now it's maybe 30. We just did one here on Oahu. I think they had like 50-some uh -huh. uh, kids. So we're always using surfing as a vehicle to teach character and to, to, to teach you know, environmental issues because we believe that we as surfers are responsible for the environment and the ocean. So we teach all that and how to give back, how to do beach cleanup, and how just to be responsible. Now, earlier you said in your Bangladesh work, you taught business entrepreneurship. Right. Is that right? So this last time we had, actually he was a coach uh, from mm -hmm. Colorado that we did like a three-part thing on business and how to start a business. And it was really effective. And even right now, uh, they're, they're mentoring and tutoring this young boy to actually start a surf business in uh, Bangladesh. So what's he going to do? I mean, what, what, what kind of business will he Well, he'll go into the be? whole surf industry, just make surfboards, shape them, and uh, begin to bring surfing, in, uh, you know, surfboards into Bangladesh because we have to bring in all the surfboards. There's no surfboards per se for sale in Bangladesh. You got to bring them all in. Do you have any follow through or continued relationship with yeah, young people go, like this? Yeah, we go this? every year and we keep in contact with them. They keep in contact with us. So it's, it's really, it's not about just blessing. It's about building. So our organization, that's our long term goal is to actually is to build something in every nation that we go to. That's incredible. Now, now, where have you had some measure of success? In doing uh, this? Right now, we, we, have, uh, we, we were able to purchase some property in Sri Lanka, and so right now we have full-time staff down there that are working in the community there. It's actually it's a Muslim community, a fishing village. They have you know, Hindus, they have some Christians in that village, and they're, every week they're doing, they have family night, they have women's tea, they, they're, they're teaching the girls how to surf. So they've actually started the first girls' surf club in uh, Sri Lanka. So you're working with both Muslims and Christians Absolutely. in a nation that has been Absolutely. torn by religious strife. Yep. And that's one of the things that's so exciting. You know, one of my Muslim friends, he came up to him and he says, Tom, like, like why, are, why aren't we doing something like what you're doing? And so I tried to encourage him, you know. And it, it's just fun because we, we work together and we, you know, obviously we um, are, we're, we're, the goal is to, to help teach morals and character. And so it's really fun to exchange, even if some, there's maybe some opposing opinions on some things, but we still get along, and I have a lot of good Muslim friends everywhere in the world, and it's exciting. It sounds like you, rece you're, you're received very well with welcome almost wherever you go. Is that the case? Yeah, well, I'll tell you a story. I was uh, surfing in Oman. I was on a boat with a Muslim guy, a turban, a long beard. At the end of the conversation, when we were getting off the boat, he said, I hate America, but I like you. And I believe that that's our whole goal is to not just, you know, is, is to really love the people right where they are and be their friend. And even as we, you know, go into North Korea, a lot of people say, like, I mean, you're going to South Korea. Go, oh, no, we go to North Korea. And then that opens up a whole other story. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about before we end the program today. North Korea, that's incredible. Yeah. How, how in the world did that open up to you in the first place? And well, you've I, gone, first of all, how many times have I've you gone? I've gone there four times. Four times. Yeah. Well, how did that get started? Well, a friend was actually there. He was digging wells. He's an American, and he was driving, and all of a sudden he said that he heard this voice say, get a hold of Surfing the Nations and see if they would consider coming to North Korea. And he contacted, you know, all the officials and stuff like that, and before you know it, we all got visas, and we were asked by the government to help introduce surfing into the culture of North Korea. We were the first official delegation to bring surfing into the nation. That's incredible. Yeah. And when you went, what kind of things did you do? And have well, you done since then? Well, we've, well we, teach, we do a surf camp there. And they actually, you wouldn't believe this, but in Pinyang, they have this huge water park with a, with a wave pool. It's a small wave. But we, we took in soft tops, the Costco soft tops. And we would teach maybe over the years hundreds of kids how to surf. And you, you can't even imagine to see a young you know, North Korean kid stand up on a surfboard in a wave pool and see the stoke and the excitement that he gets. And from there, you know, we were just had open doors all over the place. How does your presence there impact the perception of America? Oh, all the time they would ask us, like, are you an American? And, and you know, they just couldn't believe that you're an American actually being there because they just have such a negative thing. And there's so many so much anti-American propaganda 
uh, when we just were one-on-one -on -one with them. And you can imagine, I'm in the water with a North Korean in their bathing suit and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And in the end, they go, you know, we, we love America, we love you, we love surfing, and we want to say thank you for coming and being our friend. What a transformation of attitude. Yeah, oh, it's, it's amazing. But it takes, you can see the, the mindset changing uh, right before your eyes. And as we've gone back, you know, and met the, you know, the same people that we've met every year, um, it's just, it's unbelievable. And what we do is we bring, you know, like the, the silk flower lays, and we have like, we get them all together, and we bring trophies, and... You know, so we really make a big deal so about it, investing in them and encouraging them. You definitely go as Americans, but not just Americans. You go as Hawaiians as yeah, well. Yeah, we, we represent the sport because we believe that Hawaii's greatest export is it's, its music and surfing. So we believe that we can go anywhere in the world. You and take, take instruments with you, the ukulele? And yeah, we, the, well, we take guitars. So it was funny. We, just, <laughs> uh, we were out on the moon, moonlight on um, this hotel, and... Uh, my friend had his guitar, and uh, one of the girls from Hawaii was actually teaching the North Korean girls hula right there on the platform, or right at the hotel on a um, moonlit day, uh, doing the hula. It was, it was just like, That's you got something. chicken skin. You know, what do you think all of this soft, of all softest diplomacies is accomplishing up there in North Korea? I think it's just one, uh, changing people one by one. And, and I think that that's the whole key of really about life, is it's believing in people. And I believe that all the work that we've done there, and we're still trying to get back because there's a travel ban right now. So we're, we're hoping that that will change so we can get back and continue the work that we started. Well, you've come a long way from Wahiwa Town all the way to North Korea, taking the message of aloha, really. Really, it's aloha. It's, 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 it's the love that, that they all want. They all want to know that they're loved unconditionally. That's wonderful. Tom, I want to thank you for being on our program today. And I want to wish you the very best in your work in Wahiwa and across the world. Where are you off to next? What's the next destination? I'm going to Bangladesh. I Back should again. be in April. Yeah, so you're invited to come along with me. And when Let we, me check my calendar. And, and, and I'll take it North Korea, too. That'll be good for your resume. Sounds good. Tom, thank you thank so you much so for being much. with Blessings. us today. Thank Aloha. you. Thank you. My guest today, Tom Bauer, president of Surfing the Nations. What a wonderful organization, bringing transformation to little towns like Wahiwa and also crossing boundaries across the world representing the United States and Hawaii with the Aloha Spirit. I'm Kili'i Akina with ThinkTech Hawaii. We'll be right back next week. Don't go away. Aloha.